This video is part of a series of presentations covering the key concepts of multithreading and synchronization. This presentation covers the basics of creating and joining threads in a C++ program using standard APIs. It also covers basics of observing and managing threads in GNU Linux. Modern operating systems support creating threads in any process and typically threads are created via a system call and programming languages typically provide an application programming interface or API for creating and managing threads. In C++, the std thread class is used for creating and managing threads. Essentially, given a method, say do it, in the main function, you can typically call it the do it method with the necessary arguments. When it comes to threading, rather than directly calling it, we create a thread object. Here the object is t1, and the thread object t1 is going to call the do it method with the argument 10. So when this t1 object is created as part of the constructor, a new thread is created, and the method do it starts running on a separate thread, while the main method can continue to do other operations. Of course, eventually, you should call the join method on a thread. This join method blocks and waits until the thread finishes. In this case, the thread finishes when the do it method's operations are done and the do it method returns. The join method in the main thread finishes and the thread stops running. Keep in mind, many threads can be created and the threads can be created in any method in a given program using the std thread class. When working with threads, keep in mind that pass by reference works differently. This is because threads have their own stacks. Remember, we looked that threads do not share stacks. And these stacks are created by the operating system when the threads are started. So we need to give special instructions or special APIs in order to successfully do pass by reference with threading. So for example, let's say we have the do it method. Notice that it is taking the argument param by reference. In this case, when you create the thread, say here we are creating the thread t1 to run the do it method on a separate thread and pass arg as the argument to param and we want to do pass by reference, this operation is incorrect. Arguments cannot be passed to the thread directly because the stack doesn't exist until the thread is created. So in C++, the API requires us to use a extra method called std ref in order to correctly do pass by reference with threads. So rather than directly creating the thread like this, you should actually create the thread by using the std ref around the arguments that you want to pass by reference to those threads. And without the std ref, most likely your program will not even compile on modern compilers. Keep in mind, you need to use the std c ref, c being for constant, in order to pass constant references to threads. Keep in mind, threads are just running methods. So when you call these methods, you pass uh, arguments by reference or constant reference. So you need to use std ref or std c ref in order to pass by reference or pass by constant reference. So keep this in mind, it's important. Without this, your programs will most likely not compile, and the compiler might produce a bizarre error message if you miss out the std ref or c ref wrappers for arguments. Of course, threads can also be used to call methods on objects, uh, and the key is to ensure that the object scope on which the method is being called is larger than the lifetime of the thread so that the object is not accidentally deleted or removed while the thread is actually running and that would cause serious issues. So for example, consider this class called run which has a public method called do it and it's gonna take some parameter by reference. And then in the main method, you would typically create an argument to be passed. Here we are creating an object called r which we are going to use to call a thread. Normally, you would call the method as r.doit and give it an argument. However, when you want to create it with a thread, notice that you're, we are creating a thread called t1, and notice how the method is being called. Here, we are passing pointers 
to methods and objects to be called. And notice that we are passing argument using the std ref because we want to pass by reference. And of course, the main method can start doing other operations while the do it method starts running on a separate thread. And then finally, when the thread uh, is, being, is done, we need to call the join method. This join method will block and wait until the do it method has completed its operations. If the method has already completed operations, the join method will return immediately. So it will not take any time if the do it method is already done. And it's important to call the join method on all of those threads so that we correctly reclaim threads in our programs. Of course, many threads can be created in a program. Keep in mind, thread is just like any other object, so you can use it, use the thread uh, objects as if they were strings, for example. So here, let's say we have this do it method, um, which is uh, we want to run from multiple threads. In our program, the general pattern or strategy is we'll need two loops. The first loop will spin up all of the threads, and first we need to spin up all of the threads. Then we'll have a separate loop that will wait for the threads to join. That means it will wait for each one of those threads to finish their operations and for the do it method to return from each one of those threads. So in your main uh, method, first uh, keep in mind it runs on a main thread. Here we'll create or use a vector of threads so that we can hold on to the threads that we are creating. Then we'll have a for loop where we are creating the threads each iteration of the for loop will start a thread. So as each iteration of the for loop proceeds, the same do it method is being called from multiple threads. And each one of these threads start running asynchronously, uh, just like processes run in multi-processing. These threads start running in multi-processing mode, independent of each other, performing different operations. Then we'll have a loop where we are calling the join method on these threads. And each, as each one of these threads start finishing, the join method, each iteration of the for loop will complete as the threads join and the program finishes. Note that for this uh, for loop or for the overall program, the slowest thread will determine the overall runtime of this program. Starting threads is extremely fast. You'll be able to start threads in under a millisecond, but waiting for the threads to join will be the one that will take time because thread methods require some time to run and finish their operations. And as the thread methods finish, this each iteration of the for loop will reclaim the threads. So it is important to have the, this two loop pattern in mind, first loop to start up the threads and the second loop to call the join methods. Um, of course, you can use the same pattern to run multiple threads with objects where you would create uh, uh, threads on one object in each one of those iterations. And of course, you can use two patterns where one object is used by each thread, or you can have a single object that is being shared by all of the threads. So you could use either of those two patterns. And of course, remember to use the std ref wrapper when you wanted to pass by reference to the different threads. In Linux, a thread is called a lightweight process, and we'll see soon why it is called a lightweight process. The ps command can also be used to observe threads. Here, you have to specify the da capital L flag to include lightweight processes or threads in the list of processes. So for example, when you use ps-al, you will see the process IDs and also the lightweight processes, that means these are the threads that are generated by that given process. Notice that the process ID will be the same for all of the threads because all of these threads belong to the same process. However, the lightweight process ID will be different. Notice that the lightweight process ID for the main thread is the same as the process ID. Remember, the main thread is the one that starts running immediately and runs the main function in your program. So the Th main thread has the same process ID as the process itself. However, all of the other threads that are started by the process will have different process IDs. So in this case, five additional threads were created. So in total, you have six threads where the main thread is included as part of one of the threads. So in total, you have six threads, the main thread being the first one that then spun up five additional threads. Keep in mind, killing any of these threads will kill the whole process. So there is no way to just kill a single process using a single thread using a kill command. So if you use the kill command to kill any one of these threads, 
it'll kill the entire process and all of the threads. So be cautious when using the kill command to try and stop a single thread. It's not possible. The RNA system manages processes and threads in a very similar manner when it comes to the lifecycle and scheduling. That is, a thread will behave almost in a similar fashion as a process. In fact, that is one of the other reasons why we call it a lightweight process because these threads behave in a very similar fashion to processes. The life cycle of a thread, again, is similar to that of a process. It starts with a new state and ends with a terminated state. Of course, threads terminate when the thread method finishes. Each thread goes through the three key states where it constantly transitions from the ready state where it's ready to use CPU to the running state where it's actually running on the CPU. And after its time, con time quantum is expired, it'll transition back to the ready state. However, when threads do input output or they're waiting for synchronization, they transition to the waiting state or the block state where they're not using the CPU. And once the IO operation or any synchronization operation is completed, they will transition to the ready state and then they'll be scheduled by the operating system to utilize the CPU. So it's important to keep in mind that processes and threads have almost similar life cycles. The operating system also context switches between threads. So typically processes and threads are very comparable in terms of the scheduling um, aspect here. Typically, the operating system will first schedule the process to be run, and then threads within the process will context switch to utilize different resources on the CPU. Of course, in GNU Linux, you can use the nice command to change the scheduling priority. That means you can give some higher priority to threads, and high priority threads will be given more opportunity to utilize the CPU time versus lower priority times will not be scheduled as often to utilize the CPU. So you can try and give priorities to different threads in Linux. Keep in mind when context switching happens, context switching between threads is much faster when compared to context switching between processes. This is because Context switching in a process involves updating a lot of information. This includes virtual memory mapping updates uh, that the CPU needs to map virtual memory to real or physical memory. In addition, every process has different files, sockets, and other devices that it's using. So when context switching for processes happen, all of these different devices and file descriptors have to be updated. And therefore, context switching for processes takes a lot more CPU cycles. However, threads share all of these above resources. So keep in mind, threads have the same program, data, file descriptors, etc. So once a process has been context switch, context switching between threads does not have to update the shared resources. And hence, context switching between threads is quicker or is lighter than context switching for processes. So threads are called lightweight processes, and that's where this word light comes in, is that context switching for threads requires fewer CPU instructions when compared to processes because threads share a lot of the resources. There are different strategies for threading. Earlier, threads were usually implemented in user space. Here, the kernel knows nothing about threads and the kernel is only managing processes. And the programs typically use a threading library to accomplish thread-like operations through clever use of method calls. Keep in mind, with threads in user space, the operating system is not really aware that the program is trying to emulate or run with multiple threads. The more common use, uh, use cases is where the operating system now knows about threading. Here, threads are created and stopped via system calls, so the operating system knows and is aware that the program is running with multiple threads, and these threads are managed and scheduled by the operating system, similar to how processes are done. Within an operating system, there are several different approaches that are used to support threads. 
The most common one that are used these days is called one-to-one -one threads where the kernel creates lightweight processes corresponding to each one of the threads that are being run in by the user. The kernel is explicitly managing each one of these threads and this is the most common model that is used. In some cases, the operating systems may also support one-to-many threads. Here, a single kernel thread or lightweight process that is used to represent multiple user threads. So here the kernel first schedules the lightweight process and the lightweight process then can decide which user thread to actually run. It is important to keep in mind the difference between processes and threads. Processes all have independent resources that are not shared versus with threads, they share a lot of resources. Consequently, resource per thread is limited, but the context switching for threads happens very quickly. Processes can be terminated independent of each other, so it is much easier to start, stop, and kill processes. Here, threads cannot be killed individually, so when we kill a thread, we have to kill the whole process, so it's a little bit harder to monitor and manage misbehaving threads. Processes use heavyweight context switching because each resource is independent and context switching has to manage and update resources. Threads share resources, hence context switching is lightweight and hence threads are also called lightweight processes. Processes can use special streams. Each one of the process has independent input-output streams that can be used for piping, redirection, and threads do not have any special streams because all of these streams are shared. So you cannot do any special uh, input-output redirection or piping between threads. Um, keep in mind the shell can be used to accomplish the redirection of piping for processes, but with threads, you will not be able to accomplish this redirection of piping. It will still work at the process level, it's just between threads, you will not be able to do piping or redirection. All right, this series is continuing to cover concepts on multi-threaded programming. We already did the introduction to threads and synchronization in a previous part of the series. This part covered the basics of multi-threaded programming in C++. Next, we'll look at timing and performance assessment of multi-threaded programs. The next part of the series will cover threading without synchronization for data parallel programs. And the last three parts will cover threading with synchronization with single resource, multiple resources, and also with the producer-consumer model. Hope you found this presentation interesting. Ensure that you check out the other parts of the series of presentations.